Okay, so in this one, so in the big molecule that's over on the left side, this one is labeling functional groups. So I did give you this handout, this one you see. So this one is really identical, pretty much. It's identical to the laminated one that you'll have on your test. So this way you've got one to kind of refer to. So looking at these, looking at this molecule, can you tell me one of the functional groups that you see? Where's the phenol? Up at the very top, okay? So she's got this one, right? So see the aromatic, see that six-membered ring alternating single and double bonds, but then it has that OH on it. So instead of being an aromatic, that makes this a phenol. So remember that names all parts of that. So you wouldn't name the alcohol separate. You wouldn't name the aromatic separate. It would just be called the phenol. So it's another one. Okay, mm -hmm. so the other one, so the other ring is the aromatic. And this is what I told the, the day class. I was like, so an easy sort of like rule of thumb when you go to start identifying these is first, look for any six-membered ring. They're either a phenol or an aromatic, right? If it's a six-membered ring with alternating single or double bonds. So first, identify the aromatic and the phenol. Then the second thing to do is look through the molecule and look for any sulfur, because if it's a sulfur, you know it's what? Because mm -hmm. that, remember, is always going to be a thiol. So you can circle that one off. So then the next one is look for any nitrogen. Find any nitrogen that you see. You know that a nitrogen is either going to be an amine or an amide. So do you see any nitrogens? The one that's just up above the aromatic. So everybody see this one here? So what does that make this? It's an amine. Because if you look at the carbon it's attached to, notice it just has a hydrogen. There's no double bond oxygen, so I know that this is an amine. Do you see any other nitrogens? Hmm? Down at the bottom. Okay, so do you see this nitrogen? And when I look at this nitrogen, you look at the carbons on that it's attached to. Do any of those carbons have a double bond oxygen? Yes. So do you see this? Okay, so that's what makes this an amide. So when you find a nitrogen, look at any carbons connected to it. Look to see if any of those carbons have a double bond oxygen. If they don't, it's an amine. If they do, it's an amide. Okay, so now basically all that I see left are just oxygen groups, right? So the oxygen groups is where you really have a bunch of ones. So find oxygens on the end. So oxygens on the end, they can be alcohols, they could be aldehydes, they could be carboxylic acids. So by what I mean by on the end is they're always like on the end of a chain. So they're like sticking off of a carbon that's not part of the chain. So do you see any of those? So that can be an alcohol. Beside the aromatic, okay. So this one, to the left of the aromatic, so you can grab one of each of those, because that one and that one, we're working on that one, but that's kind of a reference for you. So what would that one be? It's a carbon with a double bond oxygen and an OH. Mm -hmm, which is what this one is. This is the carboxylic acid. That one can be on an end. Carboxylic acid. Find another one on an end. So do you see the one that's on like the down in that bottom left? So do you see this oxygen here? 
So see that that's just a carbon with a double bond oxygen and a hydrogen. Anybody know what that one is? It's an aldehyde. Okay, so if it's on an end, it's going to be an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. It could be an alcohol. Alcohols can be anywhere, but an alcohol is if the carbon has only an OH, nothing else. Okay, so where else do you see oxygens? So right beside the amide. So there's, here's the amide. So to the right, okay? So you see this out oxygen here. When you look at the carbons, notice those carbons on either side is just hydrogens. So this is where you have an oxygen that's spanning carbons in a chain. So this is a what? Yep, it's an ether. Ether, ether, that's fine. Pronounce it however you want. Okay, so see how an ether looks just like it's an oxygen that's part of the chain? Keep looking for oxygens. There's three more oxygens. The one by the phenol. So the one that's a part of the phenol you would not name, but there's one that's just below. Do you see this one? Did you see that OH? It's just sticking off of a carbon, so that would be a what? That's an alcohol. Alcohols can be in the middle, but they can be on the end. The key thing with an alcohol, different from carboxylic acid or a phenol, it's just attached to a carbon that doesn't have any other oxygens or nitrogens or anything else. One more. Mm -hmm. The one below it. So do you notice when you look at this one, look at the carbons on either side, one of those has a what? Mm -hmm. So notice how this is different from the ether because it's got a double bond oxygen on an adjacent carbon. So that makes this a ester. So see the difference between an ether and an ester. They both have that oxygen in part of the chain so always look at the carbons next to it. If you find an oxygen that looks like it's part of the chain, look at the carbons on either side. If there's no double bond oxygens attached to the carbon, it's an ether. But if there is, then that's actually an ester. So notice all the other ones are just single carbons, carbon, carbon, carbon in this. What's this one though? See, that's a double bond. So that makes this a what? All single bonds are alkanes. If there's even one double bond, it's a alkene. Mm -hmm. So that double bond makes it an alkene. So you've got that list in that upper left corner on your handout. So that's all of them. So this is the same one that's in your PowerPoint, the one that we didn't label last time. We should go, go back and practice that one just to see if you can label it, but you've got this one as an answer, so I'll post this one. Okay, the one that's, we'll do the hexagons, the second one. So first, they want you to name these. So if I name this, what is this? What's its, like, end name? It's a ring, so it's a... Mm -hmm. Cyclohexane. Right, so they always end in an A and E, but cyclo tells you it's a ring of six. So I don't have to name any of the hydrogens, but I do have to name anything that's not. And so what does that have? Mm -hmm. So these, this is a bromo. And this is a bromo. So when I make the decision to label it, which way am I going to do the ring? Do you start at the top? Start at one of the bromines, right? Remember, you always start where there's a non-hydrogen group hanging off, and then you're either going to go clockwise or counterclockwise to get the lowest number. So you could go one, two, three, four, five, and six. So that means that, that there's a one bromo and a two bromo. So when you go to list them, 
How are you going to list them? Mm -hmm. So 1, 2 dibromocyclohexane. But if I look at the one over on the other side, is it the same or is it different? It looks different. What's its name? Go through and do the same. It's still a cyclohexane, right? A ring of six. There's two bromines, and they're off of adjacent carbons. So do you notice it would have the same name? This one would also be 1,2-dibromocyclohexane. But remember with rings, when you have a ring structure, they don't have free rotation. So this is why I have the wedge and dash indicated. Remember that the wedge means like it would be sticking out away from the ring. The dash would mean it would be sticking like back away from the ring. So what were the names that we had to add in for the first one? First one is cis, right? Because remember, they're the same size, right? Either both wedges or both dashes, those are both going to be cis. But the other one has one wedge and one dash, so that means that, th that needs to be labeled trans. Okay? So that's in that handout. Did you grab one of those handout practice ones? So that's, so we just went through and did the labeling, then the naming for that group and then identification of cis or trans and that's it won't be any more complicated than that so it'll be like some kind of ring structure and there'll be two groups hanging off but the big thing to recognizing them is if you see two wedges or two dashes then you know it's going to be cis if you see one of each then you know that's trans because that's sort of showing like one sticking up one sticking down wedges two wedges are like they're both sticking up two dashes would be like they're both sticking down okay Yep, matter. still, still wouldn't matter, okay. okay? So they could be like one four, okay. like on opposite sides, but they're both wedges. There still means they both stick up the same side of the ring. So when you see the cyclohexane, if there's only one group, then you don't name it like that. But if there's two groups, then you really, like technically, can have two different isomers. You can either have the cis form or the trans, okay? And then the last one up at the top, Identification of chiral carbons. So in this, remember, you just look at each carbon. Which ones can you throw out right away? So there's one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in this chain. The first three. Why the first one? Mm -hmm, right? So remember that this says two hydrogens, so it cannot be chiral. What about the two and three? because they have a double bond. Stop that. So because it's fabulous, wonderful technology. So this one, this has this. So neither of those can be chiral. They have a double bond. You have to have four four single bonds, and all the groups connected have to be different. So they cannot have more than one hydrogen. Any others you can throw out? Not obviously, right? Because all the other ones only have one hydrogen directly connected to them. So now you have to do the comparison. So on this one, there's a hydrogen, there's a chlorine, there's an OH, and there's this whole big group over on the left. So is that chiral? Yes. Right? So all of those are different. So this one, that's a yes. Remember, it's everything above, below, left, and right. What about the one that's to the left of it? What do you think? Chlorine, right? Hydrogen. 
single carbon group with chlorine, oxygen, two hydrogens, and then a four carbon group to the left. Are they all different? So this one, this one, this, and this. Are all four of those different? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this one would be a yes. So now we're at the last one. So what do you think? Go left one more. So the carbon with the hydrogen up and the bromine down, are those different? Are all the groups different that are attached to them? Yep. So because of that, that one too. Hydrogen up, bromine down, two carbon group with two chlorines. And then over here, it's a three carbon group. So a two carbon group and a three carbon group are definitely different. So that would be a yes as well. So you would say that there's three chiral carbons in this molecule. So you just go through, toss out any with more than one hydrogen directly attached, like carbon, the first carbon. Toss out any that have double bonds, whether it's a double bond to oxygen or a double bond between the carbons. Any carbons with double bonds, you throw those ones out. Then you just look at the remaining ones to compare. What's to the left, what's to the right, what's above and what's below. And I'll have it drawn out this way so that you can actually like look at them. Okay, so that you can see everything above and below and to the left and the right. So I won't do them like a skeletal structure and I won't do them like a condensed structural formula all in a row. I'll make sure that they're split out more like a Lewis structure because I think it's easier to compare above, below, left, and right when they're written out this way. Okay? So that's pretty much, that's where we quit last time is we were talking about the chiral carbon. So I had done this. I had done the examples here of picking. Oh, it came back. <laughs> the examples of picking them out, showing you in each one. And like I said, like how this hydrogen is like next to it, I will actually make sure that it's more, looks more like a Lewis structure. Because when it looks like this one down in this bottom one, that's actually vitamin C. It's ascorbic acid. So when you look at this one, like it's kind of a challenge. One, you've got to remember it's a skeletal structure. So you've got to remember, okay, I've got to put a carbon here, carbon here, carbon here, carbon here, carbon here. Right? You've got to like make sure that you put the carbons. Then you've got to turn around and like see how this carbon only has two lines to it. So that means I know that there has to be two hydrogens, because remember carbon has to have four bonds total. So it's this one that is sort of the interesting one, but all the rest of these, like this one has to have, that has four, that has four, this has four. But all the ones that are part of the ring which ones would you throw out straight away? Okay, the two at the bottom, why? Because they have double bonds, right? So this would be a no because it's got that. Any others in that ring? Mm -hmm. This carbon, because it's got a double bond to it as well. It doesn't matter if it's double bonds between two carbons or a double bond to a nitrogen or a double bond to an oxygen. It can't be chiral if it ha doesn't have four single bonds. Okay? Do you see another one that's not? So I've got three left. Is that one chiral? No. Not, because it has two hydrogens, right? So this one's a no. It has two hydrogens. And I wouldn't give you a skeletal structure. We're just going through this as an example, just because I think it's kind of challenging to make sure you put in the right number of hydrogens. Yours will be more like Lewis structures with them all spread out so that you can do the comparison pretty easily. But now these last two. So what do you think about this one? That carbon has a hydrogen, has an OH, has a ring thing, and then it has a, two, a single carbon group above. Are those all different? Mm hmm Right? So that one actually would. It would have a hydrogen, an OH, a ring shape, and then that carbon that's above. So vitamin C actually ends up having a chiral carbon. So that's one that you would have.
This one is actually a chiral carbon, but it's a little complicated to think about it. So it's definitely got a hydrogen. It's definitely got two carbons hanging off. So they say if you go this direction and you go this direction, do you see that the order is different if I go clockwise or counterclockwise from that carbon? So those are actually different in terms of their groups because the order of bonding is different. Like if I go up from my carbon, it gets to goes to an oxygen. If I go down from that carbon, it goes to a carbon with a double bond to another carbon. So that one actually is also chiral. It's probably the more complicated one to kind of think about and look at. But like I said, you'll see stuff that looks more like this. Okay, so it'll be four carbons, five carbons in a row, bonds sticking up and down, and you're just doing that comparison. You toss out anything with double bonds, toss out any carbons that have more than one hydrogen, and then just really do a comparison of the remaining. So what are the consequences of chirality? So remember this means if you have a chiral carbon, you have right and left-handed versions of the same molecule. Okay, and so one example that I think is kind of an interesting like thought, if you shake hands with somebody, right, so that like fits, okay, but now turn around and shake hands this way. Uh -huh. So it's an, odd, it's an odd thing, same thing with chiral carbons. Normal, you're used to shaking like right-handed with right-handed, but if you shake right-handed with left-handed or left-handed with left-handed, like it's an odd sensation, they don't fit right. Well, it's exactly the same thing when you're talking about molecules that have chiral carbons. So the Food and Drug Administration actually has a rule now that if you have any type of drug that it wants to be released for use as a medicine, all of the enantiomers, so remember that chiral carbons make isomers that are called enantiomers, all chiral carbons have to have their mirror images produced and tested as part of your normal drug testing. In fact, looking at like dopamine, so Parkinson's is a disease that develops because of the loss of dopamine production in the brain. So there's a certain part of your brain that makes or synthesizes dopamine. And dopamine has a, it has a lot of roles within the brain itself. So it is like a mood neurotransmitter it is a memory neurotransmitter, but it really is a fine motor control neurotransmitter. And that's oftentimes the first time that somebody starts to notice that, that Parkinson's is beginning to develop and they'll develop a tremor, okay? So some of them will either have sort of like a handshake. Sometimes people have like a little bit of a head wobble and that's all because the brain is not able to like control fine motor movements. So you get sort of more uncoordinated, more jerky, but then unfortunately, it also ends up causing like depression. It can cause a lot of anxiety with patients that have, and they didn't really understand that until they really studied the role that dopamine has in the brain. So there was research that was done and they found that if they gave you dopamine, it wouldn't cross the blood brain barrier. So that is like the barrier that only selectively allows some molecules to pass from the bloodstream into the area that supplies blood, oxygen, nutrients to neurons or brain tissue. But they did find that one of the molecules that is part of like, it's kind of like one or two steps before the formation of dopamine, this molecule could be given to a patient and it would cross the blood brain barrier. And then the patient would take that dopa, take this medicine, and actually make dopamine from it. So they found that patients, they'd start giving them this, they called it dopa, but that one circled spot that I've got up there, that one, then notice they don't have the hydrogen on there, but there is the hydrogen that's there. But that, it has a nitrogen group, it has a carboxylic acid group, it has a phenol group over on the side. So notice all four of those are different. That's a chiral carbon. So when they first started testing, they just gave them dopamine, which is like a 50-50, or they would give them this dopa, and it was a 50-50 mix, and it had some effects. But then they realized that there was this chiral carbon. So they actually synthesized one form and the other form. And when they tested it, they found that the left-handed form, what they became L-dopa, 
the left-handed form of DOPA was actually biologically active and that your neurons would take it up, convert it to dopamine, and be able to use it. The right-handed form had no function at all. So it's sort of like a waste to give that the right-handed form versus the left-handed form. So they found a couple of meds that actually have those kinds of characteristics. So one, ibuprofen. Like what's in Advil? Same thing. There is only one chiral carbon, so there's actually a right and left-handed form of ibuprofen. One form has the effects of relieving pain, decreasing inflammation, decreasing um, fever. So one form is biologically active and does all of the things that you take Advil for. The other one doesn't do anything. So sort of this understanding led to the realization that, hey, if we've got a chiral carbon, we might be giving patients something that's not going to help them. Like we really want to just give them the form that's going to be biologically active. This became extremely obvious and led to a lot of changes in the 1940s. So there was a drug that was developed called thalidomide. So thalidomide, it was used in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s as a way of alleviating morning sickness. So one of the problems with morning sickness, and this usually runs the first trimester, sometimes that bleeds into four months along, but as hormone levels are changing, as, as that embryo is like setting up shop in the uterus, that HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, Hormone changes in the mother can trigger morning sickness. So, like you would do things like, like not get out of bed till you'd eaten some crackers, or you just resign yourself to the fact that you're going to barf every once in a while, like, like on the regular. <laughs> That's how I was for like four months. I was just every single day. You just sort of got used to it. It's just part of your life. But for a lot of mothers, they would actually get dehydrated. Like, I don't know if you remember, like in the royal family, Kate and William have had kids and like she actually had to be hospitalized a couple of times because she couldn't stop throwing up and she got all dehydrated. And so women would lose weight. They might have more like complications and that could potentially lead to having a baby that would be less healthy than optimal. So that's where this drug was developed. So thalidomide was initially developed and tested it did really well. And so it was then, but this is all like in clinical trials and stuff, you're not synthesizing large amounts. In fact, they were only synthesizing the left-handed form of thalidomide. So notice, right, and again, it's one of those odd ones, but it's right there is the chiral carbon. So you have the right-handed form, the left-handed form. They really just synthesized the left-handed form in the trials and found that it was very effective at lowering morning sickness. So you just ended up having better birth outcomes. So then it was approved and then scaled up. This was primarily in Europe. So this was like in Germany, in France, in the 1950s, when the drug was made for mass release, it ended up being produced as a 50-50 mix. So anybody that's like made cookies or made cakes, you know, like you make one batch and it's like just right. But if you double and triple batches, then sometimes things like kind of like, they're not, they don't always taste the same. Well, this is what happened when they went from just clinical trials to making enough to, to distribute to thousands of women. So it got sold as a 50-50 mix of both right and left-handed drug combinations. And the negative aspect was that the right-handed form that had not been tested is actually teratogenic, which means it has the ability to cause birth defects. So during those first three months, one important step in development is when she so start off and they have, they almost look like, like they start looking like a little tadpole. So they have like the little head and you start to get the little nerve cord and then you start to get arm and leg buds, okay? That usually happens right around eight, nine weeks along is when you start to see this elongation and so unfortunately, that right-handed form of thalidomide actually blocked 
limb formation. So there was about 10,000 babies that were born in the 1950s that didn't have arms or legs, okay? Where their hands were like on their shoulders. So their legs were like severely stunted. Many of them didn't have like their pelvic floor muscles and their formation was not correct. And so of these, only half of them survived and the majority of them ended up having to be taken care of for their entire lifetime. Like they were never, never completely like independently able to live. So this 10,000, you think, well, how did it get that bad? Well, you think women took it in their first trimester. You didn't find out about this for six months later. And so by the time these women started having babies with little short arms and legs, there were already women that were finishing up this thalidomide treatment during their first trimester, and that's where it ended up spiraling. So it took quite a while before it was isolated that there's a, there is something that's like in common with all of these children, and then thalidomide was found, and then they did the testing and realized this error. And this really led to like a big crackdown on you can't just make a drug and then like do a couple of trials and send it off. So when people gripe and complain about how much medicines cost and how long it takes for some of these medicines to actually get out to the market and then, you know, they've spent billions of dollars. Every time you have a chirocarbon, you have to make both pairs, the right and left-handed form, and you have to make them separately and they have to be tested separately too. So you can't just like deliver them. In fact, thalidomide has still a use. It's used now as a way of decreasing morning sickness in people that are going through chemotherapy and radiation. Okay? It's not given to pregnant women, even though they can make just the left-handed form. So, but it's gotten, like, it got such a very negative sort of rap about being this birth defect causing medication that they don't ever use it on pregnant women. But it has been pretty effective as a means of trying to reduce the nausea that goes along with chemotherapy and radiation. So that's like an example, an example of why, why like understanding functional groups and structures and even things as, as complicated looking as chiral carbons in terms of medication, it really does end up making a difference. All right, so that ends four and that like kind of leads us into five. So in chapter five, Chapter five is like all about reactions, chemical reactions. Why do chemical reactions occur? What kind of factors affect them? Um, what are the different types of chemical reactions? Then we'll finish it up with like some typical chemical reactions that organic molecules undergo, ones that you're gonna see kind of over and over and over for the rest of the semester. Because when we're talking about organic molecules like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, we're gonna be talking about how you build them, how you break them. And whenever you're doing that, you're either forming chemical bonds or you're breaking chemical bonds. So that's all in chemical reactions. So the very first part is like we're going to talk about what they call kinetics, which is rate, right? So kinetics is like how fast do things occur. So this is more speed. Whereas when they talk about thermodynamics, thermodynamics is looking at a chemical reaction and how heat and energy is exchanged. So when you think of energy, and I always think thermo, I think of heat, okay? So then to help you like remember, heat and energy exchange, that is considered thermodynamics. Whereas kinetics, if you're talking about reaction kinetics, you're really talking about how fast reactions occur and how you can speed them up or slow them down. So in thermodynamics, some reactions are spontaneous, some reactions are not. Some reactions you have to add energy to get them to occur. Some reactions happen all by themselves. Like if you leave like a piece of metal out, like, like your shovel, if it gets left outside and it gets rained on and you pick it up and you can see rust starting, okay? So you didn't do anything, so this is something that's spontaneous. So just being out exposed to the elements. Wood rotting would be another example. So if you bought a piece of wood and you just left it, 
It will speed up the rotting process if you leave it out. Again, letting it get wet, letting the sun hit it, dry it out, okay? That'll speed up the process. If you have wood and you kept it in a covered area so that it wasn't exposed to the elements, it would last longer, okay? It wouldn't go bad as quickly. So there's, there's environmental factors that come into play, but in general, there are reactions. If a reaction gives off heat, then that reaction is going to be more favorable. Okay, so they call that heat energy enthalpy. Okay, so the term is called enthalpy, and the way you can remember it is enthalpy has an H in the word. So H is like heat. So if heat is released, they call it exothermic, because like exo is like exit. So if it's exothermic, heat is given off. And so notice in that reaction, heat is like a product. So if you release heat, that's always more favorable than having to add heat. Because I always think if, if heat comes out, I don't really have to do anything to make it happen. Well, like if you're cooking food, so if you take like a meatloaf and you just set it on the counter, it won't automatically convert into a cooked meatloaf. You have to put it in the oven. That is an endothermic reaction. So in order to get that, the breakdown of the meat to the point that it loafs the way that you want it to eat it, that is an endothermic reaction because I have to add heat to it. So cooking, so notice here, heat is a reactant like the oven, right? If you're cooking, you've got to put all your reactants in the oven, and then that heat gets absorbed and speeds up how fast the reaction occurs. So that's enthalpy. So if heat's given off, it's much more favorable. If heat has to go in, then it's a whole lot less favorable. The other factor, look, and it did. It took it a long time, but it did finally do it. <laughs> the other factor that comes into play is what they call entropy, okay? So enthalpy is heat, and you can remember that because entropy has no H in the word, okay? So entropy is order, okay? If you have reactants and you have products, if you have reactants that start off like this, and in the reaction, this happens, Going from ordered to disordered is always favored because it doesn't require any work for those reactants to be able to spread out. So converting liquid into a gas creates more disorder. Taking 10 reactants and making it into four, do you see that starting with a lot of reactants but fewer products? That is always creating more order. So just like your house, disorder is always spontaneous, right? So like, I always give the, the analogy, like, come Monday, you're like, okay, the house is clean, I'm going to work. And by Friday, you're like, what happened? It looks like a bomb went off in this house, right? So when I had, my kids were young, like I was like, I would find like spoons in the bathroom. Why is there a spoon in the bathroom? There'd be like a sock right by the front door. Whose sock is this, right? So they would come in and things would just start, seem like they were just fly off of them randomly throughout the house. That creates disorder. And that is always like automatic. <laughs> that is favored by the universe. Disorder is always more favorable. Keeping things in order is a nightmare. Like, especially when you have children. <laughs> Trying to keep things in order, like getting everything organized, requires a huge amount of work. So it's never like spontaneous so the more disordered, this is always favored. So reaction where heat is released and you make more disorder, those are always the favored kind of reactions. Those reactions tend to be spontaneous. They're going to happen automatically. So I think of like wood. Wood rotting is like breaks down into lots of little pieces. That makes more disorder. Having it as a solid piece of wood is very ordered. So that is why it's more spontaneous to be more disordered. 
So the example in this one, like if I go from things being aqueous to things being solid, what is that? Is that going to make more order or less? So things floating in water or things as a solid? It's going to be more ordered, right? So this is more ordered. So that's not as favorable, but if heat is released, this is exothermic. Remember that this is favored, but this is not. Disorder is favored, heat release is favored. So when you have something like this, where it's gonna it's going to more order, but there's heat released, then you have to kind of compare the two. Well, which one has more disorder? Do we have more disorder or do we have more heat release? Like which is the bigger factor? What about the second one? So if Al2CO3 forms Al2O3 and three CO2s. Are we making more order or less, or more disorder? Mm -hmm. Do you see that going, we only have one reactant? And over on the product side, I have four products. So that is more disorder. It's the chaos theory, more disorder, and that's always favored. So this reaction, because I'm just making more disorder, is already going to have more favorable. I don't know what the energy, I don't know where the heat is on one side or the other side, but those are sort of signs. But for one like this, where I have more order, which is not favored, but it's exothermic, which is favored, then I have to kind of do a comparison. So what they call like whether or not a substance or a reaction is spontaneous or not is what they call delta G. So delta G, this is what they call free energy. This is the amount of energy that's available for the reaction to occur. And as long as delta G is a negative number, then the reaction will happen all on its own. Exothermic reactions that have more disorder are always spontaneous. Endothermic reactions that create more order are never spontaneous because it's going to have to, you got to put heat in and you're making things more ordered. So simple example, like I said, the wood rotting, composting, like people that compost, like put food, they put like, like table scraps and stuff along with leaves and grass clippings and they like flip it. Like that compost gets really hot, it gets really warm. It's exothermic. Things are breaking down, that's more disordered. So you don't really have to do anything to make it happen. You just have to mix the stuff together. So the reaction is spontaneous. But if I have to do something like build muscle, growth that occurs, those things don't happen automatically, right? You've got to do something for that to occur. So that's a good example of where it's not a spontaneous process. I have to put heat in. I have to put energy in. I have to work out to stimulate the formation of muscles. And I'm taking building blocks and making large structures, so I'm taking and making more order to them. And that's not going to happen automatically either. In fact, if you stop doing the exercising, then those muscles will end up breaking down. So you'll lose that muscle if you don't use them because those processes, those reactions, are really not favored. We can get them to happen, but we have to put a lot of effort into them. So they give you the example of like, you can think of a spontaneous process. Spontaneous processes are like the top one. So it's like going downstream in a canoe, right? So you just get in and the current carries you. So these are always going to be the spontaneous, right? If we have energy out, heat, if it's ex ex exothermic, and if it creates more disorder, those are always going to be more favorable or more spontaneous. Here, these people are trying to paddle upstream, okay, like herding cats, okay? So trying to paddle upstream, lots of energy, lots of energy, but you're not moving very quickly. This is when you have to put a lot of energy in. So energy is a reactant, and you're trying to create more order. It's never spontaneous.
just other examples of ways to kind of think about them. So if you look at a reaction, this first one, for example, and this one, this is going to be a much more favored reaction because if I have, and we'll just say that in this reaction, A plus B is going to make C. Okay? So in this, A and B have a certain, A and B have a certain amount of energy. So A and B have a certain amount of energy that they start with. I'm going to have to put, you always have to put some energy in to get a reaction to occur. And that energy is kind of like the hill, right? So that's the energy that you've got to put into a reaction to get it start. If the, if the hill is really low, then that's not too much energy. But if the hill is really tall, then that means you've got to put a lot of energy in. If my products have a lower energy, then I know that there's energy released in this reaction. And notice that that delta G is a negative number then, and this is going to be the spontaneous process. More favorable to occurring, A and B have more energy, the activation energy is low, and my product is actually has less energy than the reactant. And this is really why a lot of reactions occur, is the products are more stable than the reactants. Remember when we said like sodium and chloride ion atoms come together and that they're both super reactive? They have a lot of energy as reactants, but when they combine, they make salt, sodium chloride, and that is a very stable product. So that product is going to be very low on that energy level or energy scale, and so it's much more favored for that reaction to occur. But then look at the one over on this side. So over here, A and B are already pretty stable. If I want them to combine, I have to put in a lot of energy. Notice the hill looks really steep. The hill is really tall in order to make my product. My product actually has more energy than my reactants. And so that is going to require a lot more energy to get it to happen. And it's really not going to be a spontaneous process. If I want this reaction to happen more than once, I have to put energy in every single time. I'd have to push the ball up the hill, get it over, and then I'd have to do it again and do it again. But can you see with the first one, once you get A and B combined to make C in the one on the left, there's enough energy so that other A and B can combine to make C. So it almost can start like the ball rolling all on its own. So this reaction will continue as long as you have A and B. So it becomes more spontaneous. So activation energy, I said that's the hill, right? So a couple of factors that come into play with activation energy. Collision, molecules have to collide, right? So A and B actually have to physically come in contact. So there is this requirement of collision. But some molecules are super specific in how they have to collide. So some molecules, it doesn't matter if they touch, they're going to collide immediately, especially those ones with a lot of energy to them already. But if you have some molecules, they have to collide at exactly the right orientation. So that comes into play as well. So notice in this one that in this, if I have A and B, they need to slide right up next to each other. But if one is turned sideways, that's not going to happen. Okay, so if one's sideways, no reaction to occurs. They have to line up so that they're exactly in the right orientation in order to form that product. So collision and orientation are factors that end up affecting what that activation energy is. Reactants with a lot of energy tend to have an easier time with orientation and collision. 
So reactions tend to happen easier than those that are already more stable. So when we look at what what we do, we actually take and use spontaneous exergonic, right, energy releasing reactions. So we take nutrients, we break them down using enzymes so that we don't actually have to have like a flame like with our nut lab last week. So we can use enzymes to take these big molecules and break them down. So big molecule to lots of little molecules, that's favorable, right? So breaking bonds, whenever you break bonds, energy comes off. And so we use nutrients in this energy releasing reactions to trap that energy as a molecule that's called ATP. So you've probably heard ATP, it is the universal energy molecule for your cells. All your cells run off of ATP. You can make ATP from carbohydrates, from lipids, or even proteins. So you can make ATP from any nutrient source of the three. And then you use this to power reactions that wouldn't happen all by themselves, making muscle, growing. Okay, all these re processes, they are constantly going on protein synthesis. You use the energy that you get by breaking bonds in order to power the building reactions that occur, the non-spontaneous reactions that occur in the body. So when you look at, when you look at a nutritional label, they always have three nutrient molecules that are listed, right? So you have carbohydrates, proteins, and then there's fats. Well, fats really should be lipids because when they talk about fats, I always think of fats as something that's solid, like lard, like butter, like bacon grease, but it also includes the, the order of fats also includes the oils. So fats and oils together make up the group of lipids. So when looking at how much energy they get, when you look at a nutrition label, you always see that capital C calories. Total amount of calories is based on the amount of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids that are present in one serving of a sample. So in this one, so this is actually showing like there's an apple. So if you look at an apple, you see that you've got 21 carbohydrates, 0.27 grams of protein, and then 0.49 grams of fat. Well, if I took and multiplied this times four, that 21 times four, because there's four calories per gram for carbohydrates, I'd do the same thing with the protein. I would multiply that times four calories per gram. But with fat, fat has more than twice. So I'd have to multiply it times nine calories per gram, and then I just add those up. That's how you come out with 89 calories total. I would just take 20, 21 times 4, and then 0.27 times 4, and then 0.49 times 9, and just add those numbers up. That's how you get the calorie content. Salts, like sodium, magnesium, calcium that's in food, they have no calorie value because they're ions. They're not large molecules. It is strictly these three nutrients where you get energy from. So interesting, if you look at apples, you look at, what's other ones? Orange juice, apples. These are the fruits. And what would you say that fruits are high in? Are they high in carbs? Are they high in proteins or high in fat? Mm -hmm. So see, they have 21 grams of carbohydrates. Orange juice has 27 grams of carbohydrates. So they're very high in carbohydrates. Okay, then look at bread. Look at bread. Look at corn. Look at rice. Those are high in what? So those are kind of your grains and cereals. Mm -hmm. They're also high in carbs. So if you do a comparison, 
But then look at chick, look at steak and eggs. Those are animal. They're high in what? Mm -hmm. Protein and? Yep. So look at, when you look at eggs, notice there are six grams of protein, but almost six grams of fat. So they're almost equal in the amount. Steak has 19 grams of protein, but 27 grams of fat. So there's even more fat in steak. There's not an equal one-to-one. -one, so they're high in proteins as well as fat. And then butter. Butter is actually a fat that is pulled off of milk. So when you milk a cow, you chill the milk and all the cream comes to the top and then they churn that and that's what makes butter. So pretty much butter, if you look at it, it's just like nothing but. So this is just a fat source and it's used specifically for that. Peanut butter is an interesting one because notice peanut butter is kind of a mix. So peanut butter, and this was something that I told, I don't know if I told all of you in lab, but peanuts are not a nut. Right, so almonds, pecans, cashews, those come from trees. So they call those tree nuts. Where do pe peanuts come from? From the ground, okay? So they actually plant them, they grow really low, they like vine out and spread, and then they just go along and they like dig them all up. Take them, then they dry them, and then you can roast them, you can boil them. Like the boiled peanut thing, I think it's a southern thing, I just can't do it. But it's not really a nut. So. Notice that it's kind of got carbohydrates and protein and fat. So it's really kind of a combination. And it's because not, um, peanuts, it's really how the peanut plant like stores nutrients around its seed. So the peanut is really its seed. And so it stores all these nutrients so that when that peanut plants in the ground and grows a new plant, it has all those nutrients to start from. So that's where, like, our numbers are. That's where those ones come from. So out of all of them, that's really the only one where you see more of an even distribution of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. In fact, there's still higher fat in them, but that's where their number comes from. So remember, this is actually a bean. It's called a legume. So it's kind of like, it's more like a black bean or a kidney bean than it is like a nut. All right, so when you look at the nutritional facts, they will tell you total fat, total carbohydrates, and then protein. So you just, all you would have to do is fats get multiplied times nine, carbohydrates and proteins get multiplied times four, and then you just add them up. So it'd be 108 plus 60 plus 28. So I would just add those up, and that's how I got that number. So if you decide to get a pack of nabs from the machine, based on the gram nutrients below, calculate the total calories. So if there's 11 grams of protein, what would I multiply that times? Mm -hmm. So it would be 4 calories per 1 gram. So notice like grams and grams would cancel in that because it, the 4 is calories per gram. So this one would be 44 calories. It has 5 grams of fat, so that would be... would I have to multiply that by? Nine. Mm -hmm. So nine calories per one gram. So again, grams and grams will cancel. Nine times five is 45. And then the last one has 25 grams of total carbohydrate. So 25 grams times, what would that last one be? Proteins have four calories per gram. Fat has nine calories per gram. Carbohydrates have four. So this would be 100. So 44, 45, and 100, and all I would do is just add them up. So it would be, what, 189 as an exact number. So that's where those numbers come from. That's how they get those numbers. So if you look, I don't know, no. If you look at this one, it's kind of interesting because it says here the total calories are 180.
but then those numbers don't actually add. Which I was always like, well, that's kind of strange. Because if you like look at the pack of nabs, it's not going to say 189. More than likely, it's actually going to say, like it might say it's 190 calories. Because then this would have been, if this was like 5.0, significant figure-wise. The way that it looks now, I'd have to end up rounding this to 200 calories because 5 would only be one significant figure. So 11 would be 2, 25 would be 2, but 5 would only be one significant figure. So when I do my addition, those numbers would end up coming out. All right. All right, so then, second part. It's just a little bit about the kinetics. Well, how do you speed or slow chemical reactions down? Remember, you've got to make them collide. They have to have the right orientation because that's that activation energy. But here's like, this is, if I have, so A plus B makes C. So in my little image here, so A is going to be the blue, and then B is going to be the little red one. So A, and that's B. And so then C is the two of them combined. So if you like look at A, can you see that? So the little, the little blue dots, just the blue circles, those are A. The red ones are B. And then the one that you see there where it looks like the red inside of the blue, that would be C. So this one's A, this would be B, and that's now C. And so according to this, a and B have to hit each other in the right orientation for the reaction to occur. Okay, so this is sort of the normal. And remember that it's collisions plus orientation. So it wasn't doing this, and now it's just making a funny little... So what is B? How do we, this reaction's like affected by what? Heat, okay? So in this one, I'm going to add heat. So what do you see happening inside of the jar? So what's one thing you see? Hmm? Yeah, do you see how it looks like the atoms look like they're maybe moving faster? So the little red dots have kind of like a blur behind them. So this is going to increase collisions by increasing the movement of the molecules. So what would you expect this to do to the rate? Is it going to happen, the reaction happen faster or slower? Faster. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you look at this, do you see that there's two C's instead of just one? So in like the same period of time, you would have more product. The speed of the reaction increases. And so this is like why you cook stuff. So how is C different than A or B? What did we change? No? How is C, how is the container of C look different than A or B? More what? Mm -hmm. More reactants. So if I cram a lot more A and B into this container, what do you think will happen to their collisions? Yeah, because there's more of them, right? So the odds are that one of those little blue spheres and red spheres are going to run into each other because there's so many more to hit. So that'll increase collisions, and what will that do to the rate? Mm -hmm. It's going to speed up the rate. Right? Like, if you have to, like, bake something, and you're like, it says, bake for 30 minutes at 325, well... Then you like bump it up to 375, that's going to add more heat and it'll cook faster, right? So by increasing the heat, increasing the temperature of the oven, you can cook something faster. There's limits though. You can't like just 
put it up to 450 with a turkey or something and expect it to cook all the way through. It'll be raw in the middle and like burnt on the outside. But then also for C, my example is something that I'm, I'm not like a grill person. Like I'll use the gas grill, but don't ask me to go out and start the charcoal and all of that kind of mess because it's not my thing. Like I've always like, like I was pretty much the single mom, like the whole time my children were like elementary, middle, and even into high school. And so like I would go out and I would turn on the grill, the gas grill, <laughs> and then I would go out and throw them on and still be making all the stuff inside of the house. You're just like running back and forth. Like this is just a big pain in the neck. So the couple of times that I've used charcoal, you put, pile up the charcoal and you put lighter fluid on. Okay. So then you let it soak in a second and then you just take the match and throw it on there. And so I had the experience of like sitting there and being like, okay, you'd go in the house and start continue the cooking and you'd come out with stuff and it wouldn't even be lit yet. You're like, so then you like put some more on. So that would irritate the heck out of me. So I would just take the lighter fluid and like soak them. Okay. Like use half the bottle, just soak the heck out of the briquettes. And then when I throw the match, like the flames would be like, you know, you just have to make sure that it's enough, oh, far enough away from the house so that you don't melt the siding. But adding more reactant, adding more lighter fluid is going to make sure that I'm generating lots of heat and that reaction occurs, ashes those charcoal briquettes over so that I don't have to do this anymore. So yeah, I've actually just said, no, I'm not. I got rid of the charcoal, <laughs> the charcoal grill. And I was like, I had just a gas grill for many, many years. <laughs> now it's not my job. It's just not my job. I don't do it. But that's a good example. If you need, if you double the amount of reactants, you double the collisions. And that's going to double the speed that the reaction occurs. So what is this last one? So what's new in this one? What looks different? Yeah, the little green things. Okay, so I see red, I see blue, and then I see that they look like they're in these little green half shell things. And then I even see some product or C that's sitting in the little green half shells. Those little green half shells are catalysts. So what's neat about a catalyst is that a catalyst, ooh, a catalyst is going to help to bring reactants together. Pushes them together because remember we said collisions in the right orientation. So what a catalyst does is it will like take A and B and put them together like this. So it's in the perfect orientation that lowers the activation energy. So if you were waiting for things to just randomly bump up against each other, a catalyst takes A and B and pushes them together in exactly the right orientation. And that's why their activation energy goes down. So it brings reactants together in the right orientation. And it decreases then that activation energy. So we'll talk about this, finish the bulk of chapter five um, on Wednesday. So we'll talk more about like how enzymes work and then go on and talk about the types of reactions, some oxidation reduction reactions. You should be able to get all through that next time. And then we'll just leave us with a couple of organic reactions. But like I said, this whole chapter is all about reactions. Okay, but those, this is kind of like, these are good ones, practice ones in terms of like the chiral carbons, identifying the structures. This, you will have this handout when you take this, when you take the test. Remember, you don't have to memorize the functional group, but you may want to sit down and like write notes to yourself. Okay, this is this, this is that. Like, how do you recognize what is one way to, like, how do you tell the difference between an ether and an ester? How would you tell the difference between an amine and a mine? Okay, like write yourself little notes. You can put it right on that page. I'll give you the laminated page when you come to take your test.